hello, everybody. Uh, even I cannot see you, I welcome you very much to this excellent seminar from the Battery 2030 Plus initiative. And it is uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Teis Wege, um, uh, who is the coordinator uh, of one of the initiatives that are associated um, uh, uh, with this Battery 2030 Plus initiative and uh, who can give us a, I would say, unique view um, on you know uh, future ways how we can look at uh, battery research and how we can uh, accelerate battery research in a um, let's say coordinated and, and planned manner. Uh, uh, Thais uh, is from you know the Technical University of uh, Denmark, uh, where he is professor and head of the energy section since 2013. Um, he has a long-standing experience uh, in. Uh, they work on various kinds of interfaces, including interfaces and batteries, but also uh, for green fuels and uh, related materials. Um, uh, and uh, you know his approach to uh, accelerate materials research with the specific application for battery materials and interfaces um, is the idea to build up materials acceleration platforms. And I have the feeling that we will hear about more about this in the coming 45 minutes. Um, and with that, uh, without further ado, I would uh, give the floor to you um, uh, uh, for this presentation. Now, uh, for everybody who is maybe here for the first time in this, we cannot see the audience, but there is a question and answer panel at the bottom of your uh, Zoom uh, screen. Uh, if you don't see this, then uh, I, I don't know, you cannot say anything, write me a mail uh, <laughs> uh, or, or Camilla. Um, and at the end of the you know, uh, uh, talk, uh, I will go through these questions and you know, Taste will have the opportunity to engage in a discussion with you. So Taste, the floor is yours. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, and I would also like to thank both Christina, but uh, Kaisa and, and Camilla also for, for setting this up and inviting me for the, for the excellent seminar. I look forward to giving you a little bit of a flavor of, of how we view um, the approach to transform battery materials and, and interface discovery through uh, digital tools. And like Wolfgang said, I, uh, I had the section at, uh, at the Technical University of Denmark that focuses on autonomous materials discovery. And that's really also part of the, of the core of the big map project that I'll talk um, quite a bit more about today. I know that I'm most likely going to preach to the choir, but I will actually give a few introductory slides first for why materials acceleration in the field of batteries is, uh, is important. And I could actually extend this to go beyond batteries, because if you look essentially at any green tech technology out there, the cost of the material is key. So if we look at lithium ion batteries, but also other uh, green tech technologies, they account for more than half of the cost of the, of the battery. And we expect that number to increase. Part of that due to the scarcity of materials, other parts due to the process of manufacturing the materials. So this is really an approach that has general applications in a number of fields, like what I also mentioned, uh, catalysis, electrocatalysis, just to name, to name a few. But in, in batteries, it's particularly pertinent, I would argue, at the, at the moment. And, um, and let's just use the lithium ion as a, as a test case here. If we look inside the, the lithium ion battery, about two thirds of the cost is associated with the materials inside. We look at the, at the demand for lithium ion batteries. We see that the, there's a rapidly growing or almost exploding demand for lithium ion batteries and resulting increasing prices. And if we look at the, the constituents inside the lithium ion battery, take lithium, take nickel, cobalt, uh, manganese, we see the lithium prices have actually increased fivefold over the last year. Um, nickel, cobalt also in particular have gone up. So that of course has a direct impact on the cost of, of materials. And if we're so dependent on the specific composition inside the lithium ion battery, we really need to find alternatives and find them fast. And that you could say is sort of a guiding principle for a lot of what I would, uh, would, would present here today. Understand the fundamentals, and get there faster so we can get alternatives to the existing materials. If we look just briefly at, at the actual development and cost, I mean, it has gone down by 10 to 14 uh, percent per year over the last uh, decade, but now increasingly it's plateaued and now for the first year is actually going up. 
and it is going up pre-inflation hype. So uh, these numbers are actually um, sort of not even influenced by, by the inflation, but by the specific materials themselves. They would have been even worse had uh, lithium and phosphate not been reintroduced uh, to a large uh, degree in, in the EV production. So we're looking now at stagnation, maybe even, uh, maybe even uh, increasing prices over the next couple of years. But reaching cost parity with uh, with electric oh, sorry, with combustion engines is is uh, requiring a significant uh, reduction still. If we look more specifically at the lithium ion battery, and this is sort of the last introductory slide from uh, from the roadmap paper, look at it historically. You see, the last thirty years, if you look at the materials composition in the lithium ion batteries, you see essentially the same elements. You see different ratios of nickel, carbon, and manganese. You see additions of silicon. But the fundamental mechanism, the fundamental classes of materials are largely the same in this highly successful transformative battery technology. But that's looking 30 years um, of, of development in, in, in lithium ion batteries. So what can we do? If you look at the process itself, and that's really where a lot of our work starts, the battery development lithium ion uh, from the understanding of intercalation processes to the first commercialization, it's a 20 year uh, development or discovery and development process. Um, partly that is to do with the sequential um, discovery cycle, such that you have one step needing to be completed before the second step is initiated. So you'd start from an idea of a new material, whether it's from modeling or from uh, from theoretical uh, expectations. Another colleague does the synthesis. Once that's synthesized, send over to another colleague does the characterization. A third or fourth colleague that does the cell level testing and modeling and then pack level. And all of these, it's like play, playing a board game where you can be sent back at any given time, but you need to sequentially complete all the steps to, uh, to win. So we need really to accelerate the process and transcend from this sequential and some even call it Edisonian, a lot of trial and error still involved in the process, transcend from this type of discovery process if we're going to reach the ambitious goals of Battery 2030 plus. And one of the research hypotheses in the work that, uh, that we do, both in, in, in my section for autonomous materials discovery, but also in the Big Map project, is centered around the use of simulations and artificial intelligence to help us get there and get there faster. You can say it's a multi-pronged approach. So there are many different aspects that are, are being sort of implemented here. But if you look at it from a little bit of a helicopter view here, combining simulations with advanced experimental techniques, I'll show some examples of that, and machine learning in order to understand the limiting mechanisms and materials properties of the materials and interfaces in the batteries. So I'll give a couple of examples from, from BigMap that sort of you could you could group them into three uh, three different categories. One is sort of taking the, 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 the leap from atomic scale model systems towards real electrochemical systems. Another is the specific ability to model how electrochemical interfaces in batteries evolve in space and time. And then the third, which is really at the core of, of BigMap, how to use automated or even autonomous workflows and procedures in the combination uh, in so-called materials acceleration platforms to accelerate the uh, discovery process. And this is really, the, like I said, at the core of, of the big map uh, project that I will, I will introduce and talk uh, about at, at, at length here. So big map is part of the battery 2030 plus family as, uh, as Wolfgang already mentioned that Christina is, uh, is coordinating. And it's really, you could say the, infrastructural backbone of, uh, of, of battery 2030 plus. This is uh, the framework for uh, hopefully the projects that we have running now, but also future projects can interact with the, uh, the development and materials acceleration platforms that we are developing in, in the Big Map uh, project. And if we look specifically at Big Map, or for those of you that don't know what the Big Map is, the battery interface uh, genome materials acceleration platform. So you can hear there are two components to this. One is really understanding the fundamentals of the interface and the other is this platform for accelerating the discovery process. So um, as many of you know, there are 
um, goal in, in, in Battery 23 Plus is really reinventing the way we invent the batteries of the future, sustainable batteries of the future. And this is really the infrastructure part of it. What you can see is that BigMap project has partners from all over Europe. It's actually more than 30 partners that branch over academia, research institutions, in particular also large scale facilities and industry. And why is that needed? Well, it's needed because we essentially need to incorporate all parts of the discovery cycle if we want to facilitate this accelerated use of data that's generated. And just to show uh, the, the composition of, of Big Map in a slightly different way, looking at the, at the logos of all the partners, you will recognize um, leading edge uh, computational techniques in, in, in machine and deep learning from Cambridge. Uh, you can recognize um, advanced battery materials producers like BSF uh, and Umico. You can also see uh, cell producers like Northvolt and Saft and a range of, of cutting edge uh, battery uh, experts for all parts of the battery discovery cycle. And the main reason for that is we want to close the loop. So instead of having this sequential process where each pillar in, in traditional uh, battery discovery and development really lives within its own silo, we need the data streams and also the material streams to be closely linked so that you can exchange data and information in a seamless manner. So what you see illustrated here to the left is really this closed loop flow of information. You see an expert there. So it doesn't mean that we are removing the expert completely. You can have experts in the loop, but you should imagine that you can run the processes by using artificial intelligence such that I can have a computer program actually controlling the synthesis robot I can do machine learning to analyze the data, send that information back to another uh, algorithm that predicts new materials um, uh, compositions to test. So this is really at the core of, of Big Map, closing the loop, using data from all parts of the discovery and ultimately even also the utilization uh, of, of batteries in order to, uh, to have a faster development process. Uh, Big Map also has a, a number of, of, of objectives you can say that we need to reach. Uh, some are in the short term, others are in the long term. So for the first period uh, of, of Big Map, we identified what we call key demonstrators. So these are so-called 12 key demonstrators that show the potential to accelerate the discovery process, either by taking a single step and accelerating that by uh, orders of magnitude, or by combining different steps that allows you to uh, leapfrog traditional bottlenecks in, in the battery development. But there are also some, you can say, some general um, development themes that we have. For instance, a, a, an app store where uh, the tools that we develop are being made available to the battery community at large, because this is really an important aspect. We need to integrate data and users from the entire battery community. Uh, also, a common language, bad info, that I'll talk about in a bit. So a number of, of fundamental things that will facilitate the ability to communicate and exchange data across, uh, across platforms. Also, combining theory and experiments. What I would like to do today is also to give you a little bit of a taste of the work that's being done in, in Big Map and actually doing it from the perspective of our work packages. So what I show you here is the organizational structure of Big Map. So you see five um, pillars that typically look like something you could have in, in any uh, EU project, one on atomic scale simulation, another on multi-scale uh, modeling coordinated by our, uh, our um, chairman here today, uh, on one on modular synthesis robotics, one on characterization, and one on high throughput testing and, and screening. But then you also see these five horizontal uh, work packages that deal with these general concepts, understanding of interfaces through this shared ontology and standardization and protocols, which are key also to optimizing uh, battery materials, infrastructure and interoperability, so how we can exchange the data. They're using uh, AI-based tools to accelerate materials discovery, and finally, deep learning techniques for understanding the genomics, you could say, of, of battery interfaces. 
So I'll try and give some examples from these work packages and where we are in, in the big map uh, project uh, today. The overall goal is really to reach a, a five to tenfold acceleration in the process. So instead of having 20 year development uh, cycles for new uh, battery materials and, and, and cell designs, we are hoping that we can reach this in, in two to five years instead. The key thing to, to take uh, from this slide, for those of you that haven't seen it uh, before, is really the fact that all of these arrows are bi-directional. So information coming from one of these domains, whether it's from atomic scale simulation, uh, autonomous robotics, random characterization or manufacturing and testing, all of these can exchange data uh, seamlessly with the platform such that you can orchestrate the acquisition of data such that you can get the data from the source where it's most needed at when it's uh, needed. And you can then control the other parts of, uh, of the development cycle. So a computer can control an experiment and an experiment can launch a simulation if that's needed to, um, to, uh, to deploy the discovery cycle. So this integrated picture, although only drawn here in two dimensions is really what you should keep in mind of a fully integrated uh, infrastructure and big map. And in order to get this to fly, data is key. And uh, here, uh, our data management responsible is uh, Ivano Castelli, who has been doing a great job together with uh, colleagues in Battery 2030 Plus on, on ensuring data standards uh, across Battery 2030 Plus. But for us, data is more than just uh, numbers, right? It's essentially all the information that we develop and generate throughout, uh, throughout our research. It can be the laboratory notebooks that I'll get back to in a bit. It can also be in particular the workflows that we, uh, we deal with. And all of this information and the exchange of, of data is, is key. So if we want simulations to support experiments or vice versa, in this case illustrated here to the right, you have an experiment performed in our characterization work package then that needs some additional input from, uh, from uh, simulations at the atomic scale. What information is that uh, consisting of? What's the origin of that data, which method, all of that data and metadata needs to be accounted for, 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 the, uh, for the acceleration process to, uh, to, to be successful. The other part that I think is important to stress when we look at uh, battery data is that it's not just um, a platform for a single project. Although we are developing the tools using the data streams inside the, uh, the big map project, um, all of the, you can say the things behind the scenes, it is really intended to be um, a data infrastructure that where all other projects from Battery Train 30 Plus, but also other European projects can utilize the framework and the data infrastructure that we um, develop to accelerate their own research. And I'll try and show a couple of examples for how the, the tools that are being developed in, in, in Big Map and Battery 2030 Plus can be used to um, accelerate this process. One thing that's uh, essential is that you need a common language. You need to be able to share information across uh, the different uh, pillar domains or traditionally pillar domains. And here we are very fortunate to have uh, Simon Clark from, uh, from CINCEF as head of our work package seven, which deals with the battery interface ontology or this common vocabulary, you can say, that links um, data in a machine readable uh, format to ensure interoperability of battery data and, and apps, and also enable an interactive uh, battery, uh, sorry, data management plans. So be careful when you spell bad info, it's not with a D but two T's, but that being said, you can actually use um, bad data, bad results in, in the training of a lot of our models. But developing this common language is key. A lot of this, many researchers won't see, but for, for Big Map to be successful, we really need this to operate behind the scenes. So it's, it's really a, a backend tool that enables apps to work together, uh, with semantic battery data, um, if, uh, for instance, uh, I'm now looking at uh, uh, how a given um, competence is, is connected, what uh, links to, you can see here what was a negative electrode material, how does that connect to a battery cell? 
these has parameters, all of this, so you can identify the, uh, the links between uh, different, you can say, battery uh, characteristics, but you can also do it with competences. For instance, Simon here has picked himself, how is Simon connected to uh, other experts? Uh, what competences does he have? That kind of ensuring a machine readable format of, of, uh, of expertise and, uh, and actually also uh, fair data sets. This is uh, something that goes on behind the scenes in, in the big map uh, infrastructure. What we would like to achieve is really to make a modeling and, uh, and development framework that has predictive capabilities. And you can say a lot of that boils down to finding ways of linking battery materials and interfaces, their structure and composition directly to the functionality. So a lot of work has been done in the area of catalysis when it comes to this and in heterogeneous catalysis, there are simple descriptors that allows you to link structure and composition directly to its functionality. In battery chemistry or electrochemistry, this is more complex. If you look at the uh, time and link scales involved in uh, critical uh, processes in the battery, you go all the way from angstrom to and femtoseconds up to hours, days, years, and, and centimeter to meter scales where different critical phenomena can occur. So if you want to predict a new battery chemistry, you would actually need to be able to describe the durability of that specific battery in something that would require warranty of eight years. To put it mildly, there's no single technique that allows you to bridge that many scales. In Big Map, we're to a large degree focusing on sort of accelerating the procedures that have atomic scale precision to be able to address phenomena at, at longer time and link scales. That has its, its uh, you can say its limitations, but that's really the way that we get the sufficient understanding of the physics and chemistry that we can, um, can develop new uh, battery materials and, and interfaces. We can also go the opposite way and take a mesoscopically observable phenomena. I'll give one example here from a colleague in my own group, where we can observe phenomena at a certain scale, and then you could go down in scale or up in complexity, and then do your parameterization, optimization at uh, the level required to sustain predictive accuracy. I think that's really key to a lot of, of the developments that we are doing in, in Big Map Project. We want to sustain predictive accuracy. Let's take um, one study here, which is the development of, of dendrites in, in lithium metal batteries or solid state batteries. You know, that's one of the ways that you can increase the capacity by a factor of two in, in uh, lithium batteries. But the fundamental understanding and how to limit uh, dendritic growth, that's a complex challenge. It depends on composition. It, can, it depends on the charging and discharging. So one of the things that my colleague Jin Hyun Chang uh, did was try to develop phase field level simulations that allows you to have atomic scale informed uh, decisions and, 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 and modeling done. Again, making tools that are easy to use where if you are let's say an experimentalist uh, interested in, in testing out what a new additive could do to suppress dendritic growth, you really don't have to worry about all the complex chemistry and quantum chemistry behind the scenes. You should have a nice uh, graphical user interface that allows you to check a certain composition of uh, the electrode or the electrolyte, and then run the simulations under the intended operating conditions. So this is the case where a lithium metal anode and uh, LIP of six uh, uh, salt and uh, an ECDC uh, electrolyte, you have running that at different conditions. So different charging potentials. And you can see for this specific combination of temperature and pressure, if you're too aggressive, uh, you actually start forming uh, dendrites uh, in the battery. So you can identify the conditions or you can see what would be needed in order to modify the composition or the temperature to suppress dendritic growth. So you would have a tool available that would tell you under these conditions, these are that uh, over potential, these are that conditions in terms of temperature. You can deduce parts of the underlying physics that you don't form the dendrites if the interfacial concentration of the lithium ions is high, but you form them when it's low and you can see what is the safe operational window. So that's a kind of tool that will allow you to quickly assess 
what uh, adding a certain additive or changing the temperature could do to suppress a critical reaction at an interface. And interfaces are really key to, uh, to BigMap and the work that we do. Uh, the ability to understand electrochemical interfaces is critical. In particular, the interface or the solid electrolyte interface plays a critical role in essentially all uh, battery technologies. And we can't just do, you can say, brute force uh, data-driven models and expect them to be able to capture the complex physics that uh, occur at the, at the battery interface. We need to develop what we call physics and uncertainty aware models that can ingest to incorporate data from multiple streams, like I showed in the previous slides, but also data of multiple fidelities. So certain data sets where we can generate a lot of data, others where we can only do one single high fidelity experiment. That needs to be something that we can incorporate in the models because a lot of the limiting processes can span a range of different uh, time and link scales like that I also showed uh, earlier. So here, uh, machine learning is uh, one of the avenues that we are pursuing and different flavors of machine learning to capture uh, the complexity of, uh, of the uh, electrochemical interfaces. There are um, great techniques, uh, you can say headed by a number of, of uh, people in the, in the big map consortia also using uh, fingerprints and, and Gaussian-based uh, processes. So we might've heard of, of, of SOAP. Neural network potentials, if we have slightly more complex uh, interfacial reactions that we are, are looking into. There's some issues about long range effects also that need to be taken into account. But for fully operational battery systems, it's really hard to train um, uh, you can say uh, machine learned potentials that allow them to capture the complexity of, uh, of the typical uh, electrode electrolyte interfaces. Graph neural networks is another area that we are, are looking into. Um, but just to sort of go back up in, in the helicopter a bit, what it is that makes uh, the development of these potentials so difficult is that when you're looking at the variation in the inter and intramolecular forces in organic electrolytes on the, on the metal surfaces, you span a, a very wide range in, in inter and intramolecular forces that makes it difficult to train general uh, workflows that would allow us to describe uh, organic electrolytes with additives and salts on specific uh, surfaces. So Gabor Czerny and, and, and colleagues at, at Cambridge are heading uh, a lot of this work, which is one of the pillars in uh, the uh, work package two, which is headed by uh, Shasti Hermansson from, uh, from Uppsala, which deals with the acceleration of atomic scale uh, simulations. So really having workflows because a lot of what we we do are based on, on workflows that are as generalizable as possible we, ge we develop a workflow that others can use that allows us to go beyond the time and link scales of what uh, what can be done in a single uh, image uh, sorry a single um, a single dft level uh, simulation so this is um, some examples from uh, münster first here of md simulations of of the chemical reactions that are at the core of, of SCI formation, where you can actually map out the beginning of, of species formed in the electrolyte that then subsequently are deposited on the electrode surface. Um, you can also see the development of machine learned potentials uh, for electrolyte mixtures. And uh, this is some of the work at, uh, at Cambridge where they are able now to account for uh, these variations in inter and intramolecular forces such that we have almost the same uh, radial distribution functions as, uh, as we would have with traditional and much, much lower potential. It's also the work package where we can provide experimental uh, validation of, of chemically of electrochemical spectra that are obtained, uh, mapping out which species account for the experimentally observed spectroscopic uh, fingerprints and deduce the composition of species. This is work done at, uh, at CNR. Moving up in scale and to our uh, chairman of today's session, uh, actually bridging towards the, the longer time and link scales. Um, this is one example of recent work using uh, kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, again, looking at the 
SEI formation and growth on a time scale that you can see here of microseconds and on link scales that are approaching also the, the micrometer uh, range, setting up a set of equations where you can also see that you actually start to form inorganic species, these purple species in, uh, in the electrolyte before depositing on the surface and you start then growing, uh, growing the solid electrolyte uh, interface at certain regions on the electrode. And there are certain properties that you would like from the SEI that are then focused or localized here in, the, in this purple region, whereas other regions form other, um, other SEIs that uh, have, uh, have less, uh, you can say, uh, interesting uh, properties. So the ability to run simulations at relevant time and link scales, but with the high accuracy is really key to the way that uh, that we do uh, work in, in BigMap. Another critical part in, in the, the chemistry and electrochemistry is really uh, predicting the reactions. Um, work done in, uh, in, uh, in DTU at uh, Professor Gierba Homik's uh, group that allows us to set up frameworks that can predict chemical reactions. Some of that using simple uh, linear regression uh, models that can Apply, be applied to uh, density functional uh, uh, theory calculations, and then identify systematic errors in those data sets that can be corrected such that you can get or ensure that you have predictive accuracy with cheaper methods for predicting uh, chemical reactions and what compositions could be formed in, in the electrolyte. For instance. This is something that uh, requires very large uh, training sets. I think this training set for, uh, for this, this multi-XC uh, training set, I think is a close to a, a terabyte in, in data, but I'll get back to that in a bit. But models that allows us to predict the reaction networks and the reaction energies are key to, uh, to the work. Um, so following on that example is the ability to predict the rates of the chemical reactions. And this is something that uh, we are also focusing on, how to train um, machine learning potentials that can predict reaction energies or reaction barriers, sorry, not reaction energies. This is something that you can't really do with traditional uh, training sets on using only equilibrium structures, but by including structures from the near transition state regions, you can train your um, uh, networks, and in this case, also a, a path technique, such that it's able to predict reaction energies for the specific chemical reactions. In this case, uh, a method that uh, Matthias Schreiner and, uh, and colleagues uh, developed using a, a data set called Transition 1X that actually has these specific structures in, such that you get a completely different predictability of barriers with a cheap calculator instead of having to run full complex uh, density functional uh, calculation. But like I said, all of this hinges on, on the ability to, to have good training data. So another important part in, in BigMap is really the data infrastructure. And here we have a specific work package headed by Professor Nicola Mazzari at, at EPFL, so work package nine, that deals with the, the data infrastructure and how to share and exchange data. A lot of the, uh, what I show you here is a private uh, archive in BigMap so that we can share data in a, a, a way before you can say it's, it's published, but in a way where uh, other uh, colleagues in, in data, uh, sorry, in BigMap can use the data in their research to accelerate the discovery. You can upload uh, your data sets in a format and in a form that's equivalent to what's on the materials cloud. You can edit and delete uh, uh, records. You can navigate between different versions of, uh, of, uh, of the data. And we are making this available now to the BigMap uh, community. Soon it will be available to the entire Battery 2030 Plus community. And when the data is publishable, it will be uh, released by the push of a button to uh, Materials uh, Cloud Archive. If you're interested, those in, in, in BigMap can actually now go in and, and, and try and, and get, for instance, the Transition 1X uh, uh, data set from, from the archive here. So having this shared archive in a form that opens up for the interoperability with other projects in Battery 2030 Plus and ultimately same framework for, for Materials Cloud is, is key to the, the seamless integration of data. 
So the example that I mentioned before is from a computational uh, data set, but it can also be experimental data. And here our work package eight, headed by uh, Professor Alexi Grimont from CNRS and now also uh, the Boston College, uh, has really generated, again, an easy to use electronic lab notebook where a lot of the standardization, a lot of the protocols, but now also the ontology is done behind the scenes. So once you are, you are an experimentalist performing either a electrochemical experiment or a structural characterization, once you upload the data in using the electronic lab notebook, the data and the metadata will be uh, ontologized and shortly or in uh, hopefully not uh, too long time, also archived in, in the archive I just showed you where everybody can, uh, can then use uh, the data. So developing these, um, you'd say tools as easy to use is important for, uh, for the success of, uh, of an infrastructure like this. It has to be the easiest available solution out there that does all the complex handling of the data and the metadata behind the scenes such that we can utilize um, the uh, bad info uh, ontology with uh, development of, of custom APIs that allows us to say, use, uh, use the BigMap archive and all of the workflows that are developed in BigMap either by BigMap participants themselves or by other uh, participants in, in, uh, in projects uh, across Europe that are also very welcome to upload apps to, uh, to, to BigMap uh, App Store. A critical element in uh, sort of achieving the goals in, in, in Big Map, both the short and long-term goals, is the use of what we call integrated autonomous workflows. So these are workflows where using uh, the kind of infrastructural tools that I, I just showed on the, on the previous slides, you can go in with, uh, it can either be a specific materials property that you want, you can look up the best materials that are out there either in, uh, in existing databases or through uh, specific synthesis recipes. You should be able to re deploy a request for, for that material. It can either be submitted to a simulation or an experiment, so a synthesis experiment. But the analysis of that data that's generated should be done in an automated way using some of the, um, the machine learning based uh, tools that are also being developed such that you get information on the fly that can be sent back launching yet another uh, simulation or another uh, synthesis round without essentially requiring people in the loop. One of the things that, uh, that we are, are targeting in, in BigMap is using this in a decentralized or distributed way using asynchronous workflows. And I'll give one example uh, from that from the uh, group at, at KIT, where you can utilize competences and resources at different locations across the network when that resource is available and capable of delivering the data that you need. But I'll give, uh, I'll give that example in a bit. I'll start with an example that relates to a purely uh, computational workflow. So this is work done by um, a former postdoc uh, in our uh, section called Felix Bühle, where he used the uh, ICSD uh, database to look for potential electrode materials compositions for a magnesium uh, electrode. Automatically, he could screen potential structures and candidates and generate uh, simulational structures that would allow him to map out what is the expected uh, potential at low and high state of charge, but also in a systematic way, assess what are the transport kinetics. So actually do an accelerated procedure for assessing the kinetics of an electrode without having to synthesize and test, uh, test the electrode. What uh, came out of, of, of this specific study was that a number of different uh, structural motifs were identified as having potentially interesting candidates. So both uh, Chevrel, Spinel, and Garnett, where to this relatively simple workflow, you could see what is the potential at low and high state of charge but you could also see as indicated here on the right, what is the potential for fast uh, charging of, of that specific electrode, for instance, some of the spinels here at low and, and high state of charge. So this is a way that you can map out all the potential structures and get information about the um, kinetic property, sorry, the, the thermodynamics, as well as the kinetic property. 
When we say that we try to make the workflows as generic as possible, exchanging this to look for, let's say calcium would not take much other than changing a few lines of code in the, in the workflow to enable this reuse of, of workflow and reuse of data. Another example that's basically based on the same principle, this is from Ivano Castelli's group, uh, uh, where uh, Benjamin Chalin did a study using a similar type of workflow to look for solid state electrolytes, which are otherwise not something we are targeting directly in, in the BigMap project. He could then again screen another database with a large number of possible structures for both thermodynamic and kinetic properties by using a simple model that in a single DFT level calculation, predict what is the charge density of the structure and then using the charge density to do a fast prediction on the low energy uh, path for uh, transport inside the solid electrolyte. By doing it in this simplified way, it's possible to cut down the number of, of complex DFT level calculations that have to be done. So out of the 20,000 candidates that were in this database, it then boiled down to essentially 10 uh, candidates using this chemistry agnostic uh, module that is now uh, available as are, uh, as are many of the other tools that I've talked about here in our um, app store. So the tools that the, the participants in, in BigMap develop are made available in our app store where a number of, of apps are available. For instance, if you want to do uh, cluster expansion or you want to use the Optimate app that allows you to get structures from uh, computational experimental databases, whether you want to do uh, this um, um, integrated experimental and computational workflow that I will uh, say a bit more about. These tools are, are made available to you in, in the App Store. There are also tools that allows you to do automated analysis of, of spectra, uh, so both the Foodproof app and, uh, and this Prisma app allows automated analysis of experimental uh, spectra, which is another key component of, uh, of the BigMap uh, project. So we have an entire work package uh, focusing on characterization techniques, particular operando characterization and multimodal characterization techniques. So here, a work package, which is led by uh, Dr. Santin Leonard from CA, um, combines, for instance, operando neutron imaging with synchrotron uh, micro X-ray diffraction to understand heterogeneities in the cells that uh, originate in, in the BigMap project here. So we can understand the fundamentals of, uh, of the materials and the interfaces during operation. So this is key combining multiple uh, experimental and computational techniques to understand the fundamental mechanisms at play inside the uh, specific uh, battery materials and, uh, and electrodes. The electrolyte is another uh, key part of, of, of BigMap. And here we have in particular high throughput screening and, and, uh, and testing work package headed by Isidora Sergei Slaskovic at the Forschungszentrum at, Jülich, uh, which does a data-driven analysis of a lot of the high throughput experimentation that they have developed in Jülich and, and meet on battery electrolytes. So coupling in different uh, machine learning techniques, either to uh, find simple uh, generalized uh, models for Arrhenius fits to predict the uh, performance or the metrics of, of the electrolytes or in another recent uh, uh, experiment or, or uh, collaboration, uh, actually trying to deduce learning the fundamental equations of of, um, of the electrolyte uh, uh, diffusion. So given data from about uh, 1200 uh, experimentally acquired data points at different temperatures, you are able to use symbolic regression to deduce the uh, governing equations for, uh, for the transport properties. The last example here is for an active learning framework done together with, uh, with KIT only using uh, single data points to predict the next uh, the next experiment to uh, to be performed. So again, coupling the availability of experimental data and computational models to predict uh, the 
you can say the performance uh, of uh, given uh, materials compositions. The last uh, example that um, I wanted to show in, in terms of, of the work uh, packages here, I did uh, two, uh, two, two examples more, but uh, here it's uh, from the robotic side of it, because we are also building quite a lot of, of infrastructure for the maps. Some of the infrastructure is already available among the partners, but there are specific modules that also have to be uh, developed. For instance, this is from work package four, uh, headed by uh, Dr. now Professor Henning Norman and from, uh, from Fraunhofer, that does liquid liquid extraction devices um, using these, you can say, machine to machine communication through a broker system. And this use of a broker uh, to relay uh, information and requests is, is really an important aspect in the way we are thinking about. Uh, these materials acceleration platforms in the, in the um, in the big map project that you need to be able to acquisition uh, data and experiments at uh, different locations at uh, asynchronous uh, requests. The last example from the uh, you can say the experimental side that I wanted uh, to show here today was the use of uh, of this Finale software uh, that was developed at uh, KIT in connection with work package 10 that's headed by Professor Helge Stein from, uh, from, from KIT, where you also use this broker server in the middle to connect what Helge terms a tenants. This can be um, a computational or an experimental resource at a given facility that can then either generate data or acquisition data from the central broker in order to perform a certain operation. So I can put out a request, I need a material uh, based on, on these and these uh, compositions. And then two different synthesis robots can then say, I can perform that synthesis. A third one can say, I can't perform that. I missed one of the precursor materials. And then you can generate the data and it's available on, uh, on demand in the uh, specific uh, uh, laboratory that you have. The data is then made available in a specific um, uh, broker server where it can be acquisitioned by other tenants in uh, in the project. Um, so that's one of the frameworks for utilizing uh, infrastructure across multiple locations at multiple times in uh, the project. The last example is from work package 11, which deals with the uh, battery interface uh, development or the, the battery interface genome. And here uncertainty aware models are really uh, key. So developing models, and this is uh, headed by Professor Gieber Homik, uh, so developing models that are uncertainty aware is central to uh, the uh, specific uh, performance of, of these models. So we need to uh, have models that know when they don't know, and then knowing where to get the most valuable data. And this is work combining uh, work from uh, Jonas Busk and, and Laura Rieger at, at DTU. So separating out what are the origins of the uncertainty in the system? Is it the data itself? Can we, we alleviate the performance by adding extra data? Or is it something where the uncertainty is associated with the model? So what Laura has done here on the, on the right-hand side is then mapping out based on only few cycle data, what is the predicted uncertainty of the end of life for the battery. Um, and then based on the uh, uncertainty of, uh, of the prediction, you can then acquisition more cycle data if it's needed to reduce this uh, uncertainty to an acceptable level to make a prediction on the battery end of life. And those were the examples that I had, uh, had uh, selected for presenting the Big Map project and our digitalized approach to, um, to accelerating the battery discovery cycle. I think the key uh, information here is really the transition from the sequential and Edisonian development uh, process, the use of data from all parts of the discovery cycle to the development of shared um, um, ontologies to the development of data standards and protocols, but also uh, the ability to um, to develop models that allows us to, you can say, uh, predict the physics and chemistry at, at uh, electrochemical interfaces at much longer time and length scales than can be done today. 
So looking a bit into the future here at the very last uh, minute, one of the things that we want to do with the big map infrastructure is also to integrate data from the smart functionalities in the battery cells, self healing, sensing directly into the process such that we can include uh, aspects like manufacturability, recyclability and sustainability by design. So I have spent my time, I can see my chairman. So I would just like to acknowledge, essentially this is easy. I wanna acknowledge Big Map because everybody participates here, but also the partners in, in Battery 2030 Plus. Um, I've shown examples uh, from, from work at, at DTU with these uh, people involved here. And of course, also uh, thanking the European uh, Commission for the funding of, uh, of Big Map uh, and other funding agencies where I showed uh, some results from. So with that, I would just like to thank you for, for your attention and, and look forward to the Q&A.